If you are able, would you please stand with me for the reading of God's Word? Amen. Hear the word of the Lord this morning from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, starting in verse 4. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you ready to receive your word, Lord. Would you prepare our hearts to hear the word preached? Would you speak clearly and boldly and powerfully this morning through Brandon? Uh, Give him the words to say and give us the ears to hear uh, what you have to say to us through this passage, Lord. Thank you for your love. Thank you for sending your son for us. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Uh, If any of you are new around here and haven't uh, been coming for longer than three months, you may be wondering who I am. Uh, I, my name is Brandon Dean. I am the associate pastor here at New City Church, and uh, I have been gone for the last three months on sabbatical, and so today is actually my first day back on the job, and so uh, thank you. Uh, Ryan thought it would be great to welcome me back by having me preach, and so, no, I, I volunteered. It was good. It was, it's all good. Um, I want to say thank you uh, from the bottom of my heart. My wife and I, we've really had a season of rest and restoration. Uh, God has done some amazing things uh, uh, through the time we've had away. Uh, We've gotten to travel a bit. We got to visit uh, old places and see new places. And uh, the Lord has, throughout that time, reminded us in many, many ways of how you are our family and Lawrenceville is our home. And um, we're coming back ready to be a part of what's happening here for years and years to come. And it's because of your generosity, and that's why I'm thanking you. Um, Not every church cares for its pastors as well as this church does. And uh, this opportunity has been uh, life-changing for us. So thank you so much. Thank you for being a church that lets us be your pastors. And what I mean by that is we do what Scripture has told us to do, which is to equip you as the saints for the work of the ministry. And it's because you're willing to step up and do the work of the ministry uh, that uh, people like Ryan and uh, Patrick and I are able to uh, continue to do this for years and years. So thank thank you so much. Um, I have the privilege this morning of kicking off our Advent season, uh, or series rather, and I hope that you all had a great Thanksgiving, and um, you know, God is so good and so faithful and so deserving of our gratitude, isn't he? Um, And I think now that Black Friday is finally behind us, maybe the emails and and texts will uh, let up a little bit, and maybe we can uh, give some real attention to the season of Advent Uh, which is really the time of year where we commemorate uh, the events of Christ's birth and then contemplate the implications of uh, the incarnation, you know, on our everyday lives, not just during Christmas. Um, It's also the season when I think like true Christians uh, really begin to contemplate how we might boycott Starbucks uh, you know, for daring to wish us a happy holidays as they hand us a pumpkin spice latte, right? We're, we're going to scrunch up our faces, maybe, and loudly lament our uh, dissatisfaction with the over-secularization of this holy holiday. Maybe we're going to denounce the, the commercialization of the festivities and look down our noses at people who don't seem to know the difference between generosity and materialism. Or maybe, maybe if we're really good Christians, uh, maybe we'll take a photo of our Jesus is the reason for the season bumper sticker and then passively, aggressively post that on Instagram or TikTok. Right? 
Maybe that's what uh, Christmas will be like. And, and I get it, okay? I'm being a little bit funny, but I'm saddened. I'm frustrated by a world that seems like more and more they just want to remove Christ from Christmas. And, and I look around and I see that people are interested in what we might call the fruits of of Advent, right? They're interested in peace. People are interested in hope. They're interested in joy, and they're interested in love. But they don't see the connection between those things and Jesus. They want to experience those blessings, but they want nothing to do with the one who is their source. And I have to ask myself, why? Why is that? And really, church, I think the question we need to be asking ourselves is, why not? Like, why wouldn't they want to distance themselves from Jesus when so often his followers are combative and divisive instead of peaceful? When so often we're just as despondent and hopeless as they are. When we're gloomy and discouraged instead of rejoicing. And when we seem to be more motivated by what we are against, by what we hate, than by what we love, or love for our neighbors, or even our enemies. You know, it's a sad reality, but a lot of God's people, they seem to be depressed most of the time. And as we are his chosen instrument for the promotion of his gospel message, this is a very real problem. And I think it even goes beyond our witness. It goes beyond the evangelical thing. It's a problem for us personally. Because the whole reason that Jesus was sent to us, the whole reason that he came in the form of a baby and then died for us was so that we would experience peace and hope, and love, and joy, and experience them abundantly. It shouldn't be uh, so difficult for us as followers of the way of Christ to not only experience these things, but also to demonstrate them to the world around us. And and so for the next few weeks, um, we're going to consider deeply the biblical truth that when we receive Jesus Christ, We not only get the gift of a Savior, but we also get all of the benefits of Christ, including the fruits of Advent, peace, hope, joy, and love. And we'll take a look at each of these fruits in turn and discover together how we can live out the blessings of the incarnation in the knowledge that all these things have already been given to us that they're not something we have to produce on our own by ourselves in some vain attempt to try and obtain something that we actually already have, which is God's acceptance. And by the way, uh, a lot of the concepts I'm going to be talking about today and that Ryan may allude to in the coming weeks, these come from a book that we have both read um, several times now. And uh, we'd highly recommend it to anyone. So it, it kind of has a scary name, but it's, it's a great book. It's called Spiritual Depression. It's Causes and Cures. And it's by Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. It's a fantastic read. It's actually a collection of sermons that he preached at um, Westminster Chapel in the early 60s. And uh, I do recommend getting it if you don't already have it. Um, Today, what we're going to do is we're going to spend a few moments uh, discussing and considering exactly how we receive the fruit of Advent, and then we're going to take a look at the first one of them, which is love. So so let's get into it. The, The fruit of Advent are our Christian birthright. They are our Christian birthright. You may have heard the term, uh, innocent as a newborn baby. Uh, This acknowledges a couple of truths. It it acknowledges the truth that um, most babies have not experienced enough of the world yet to understand how broken and dangerous it truly is. And it also implies that they haven't really had an opportunity yet to do the kinds of things 
that we would associate with bad people, right? And, and so in that sense, I think it's fine. I fully endorse you using the term uh, innocent as a newborn baby. But in another sense, in the biblical sense, I think we have to understand that there has never been in the history of mankind an ordinary human being who was born into a state of innocence. That has never happened. Every one of us was born into a state of sin. And indeed, we read in the Psalms uh, that it actually starts much earlier. In Psalm 51, verse 5, it says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. We all emerge from the womb with the same fundamental problem. We are sinners, and our mind is actually set on the flesh. And parents of newborns quickly come to see that their innocent little bundles of joy are actually quite selfish and very demanding. And they hurt our feelings sometimes, like Mitchell. If we stay in this state, the state that we're born into, we will not experience the fruit of Advent as we get older. When we look at peace in Scripture, we see in the book of Romans that we're told that without Christ, we are God's enemies, and that our mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. We're not at peace. We are at war with God. As far as joy, King David, in, in, as he continues on in Psalm 51, he, he says that God must restore to him the joy of his salvation after he has sinned. The joy comes with our salvation. Without Christ, we might have fleeting moments of happiness, but no lasting joy. With hope in the book of Ephesians, we're told that those apart from Christ have no hope because they're separated from God in this world. And though people without Christ may experience certain types and degrees of love, they do not understand what it means to give or receive the truly selfless, sacrificial, unconditional kind of love that comes from God. Every person is born in a state of sin, and therefore every person is in need of a Savior to redeem them and bring them into right relationship with God the Father. And when this happens, that's when we begin to see the blessing of these fruits come to life and others. And they become manifest in our lives. But sometimes it seems like maybe they don't, right? Why do some Christians seem fruitier than others? I think to, to understand this, we, we need to take a moment and just revisit how our salvation works. It, it, remember in the book of John when, when Jesus was talking with Nicodemus and he said that, in order to be made right with God, we needed to be born again, right? Born a second time, I think he said. He went on to explain that that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. And then later on, the Apostle Paul echoed this teaching when he wrote the letter to the church in Galatia. He, he pointed out that the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and then he goes on to describe the fruit of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit and how different they are. And so between these two um, messages, what we see is that our salvation kind of has a dual nature. Our salvation is all at once. We are born again in the Spirit. And our salvation is ongoing. It's a battle between our flesh and the Spirit that dwells within us. Now, the first part of our salvation, the once and forever part, that's what theologians would refer to as justification and adoption. And we see this uh, in Philippians 2, uh, verses 6 through 8. It says, though he was in the form of God, Jesus did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. This is the beauty of, of the advent of Jesus. 
Like he was born truly innocent. The holiness of God all contained in the flesh of a newborn human being. And throughout his life, Jesus was without sin. He was the first and only human being who was not ever estranged from his spiritual father. His purpose for, for this selfless act, the, the act of condescending to become a man, his, his purpose was to bring about our redemption by taking our sin upon himself and placing his perfect righteousness upon us. And then he climbs up on a cross and dies in our place to pay the penalty for our sin so that God's perfect sense of justice would be satisfied. We see that in 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That is justification. Christ's righteousness imputed to us, though we did nothing to deserve such a gift, and our crimes paid for in full, so their penalty does not hang over our heads. Simultaneously with justification uh, comes our adoption into the very family of God. Our our sinful self is born again into a truly innocent child of, of God the Father. And through his spirit, the spirit of his son Jesus, uh, and, and Jesus was called by Paul the firstborn among many brothers. Romans eight fifteen says, You did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. This is our salvation. We are justified and made right with God through our big brother, Jesus. And we've been given the Holy Spirit who bears witness of our adoption. But here's the thing, that God the Father is eternal, right? He's never going to leave us. And so we are not awaiting his death. We're not awaiting some, something to happen before we get our inheritance. We receive eternal life already. And the fruit of the Holy Spirit are ours now. They are our birthright as Christians. But there is a catch, right? You might have noticed there was some fine print uh, in, that, in that verse Paul included in Romans 8. We're, uh, what did it say? We're fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him. What, what kind of salvation is this? Well, it's a salvation that's not sugar-coated. There, there'll be a day, right? There'll be a day when, when we experience the full glorification of our bodies. There'll be a day when uh, our tears and sorrow are no more because uh, our uh, sin and death are no more. But for now, we live in an age when Christ's kingdom is uh, inaugurated but not yet fully consummated. And why does God tarry? You might wonder, why do, why do we have to wait? Why do we have to live in the broken world? Well, the apostle Peter gives us the answer in 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. And tell all the people that God the Father has given to Jesus are redeemed, Christ's work is not yet done. And in our union with Jesus, we have to continue uh, to endure the suffering that comes with being righteous people in a broken and sinful world. But God is even gracious to us now, right? He's working all things for the good. He's using our suffering to conform us ever more into the likeness of our Savior, And this part of our salvation, the ongoing part, is called sanctification. Okay, all of that theology kind of established, here's my point. I think that when Christians struggle to exhibit the fruit of the Spirit in their lives, 
it's often because we are conflating our sanctification with our justification and adoption. We mistakenly believe that our inheritance needs to be earned and that it will be obtained through our participation in the sanctification process. We think that our status as children of God is dependent upon our obedience. And forgetting that they are our birthright, we find that we cannot accept peace or hope or joy or love because we continue to struggle against sin. And then when we inevitably fail, we assume that God is withholding these blessings from us and others. And it's only when we're perfectly obedient that we can experience the fruit. And so we encounter them very, very rarely, if at all. And instead, we've traded our birthright, right? Like, like Esau. We've traded our birthright for a fluctuating amount of anxiety and despair. Af- afraid to approach the throne of our Heavenly Father because, frankly, we're afraid that most of the time He's mad at us. This isn't the way God intends it to be. There's a reason that Scripture refers to peace as a peace that passes understanding. There's a reason that our Bible connects hope with grief and joy with tribulation and points out that love endures all things. And it's because that these blessings are intended to be ours in the midst of the struggle. They are our birthright. They have been bought and paid for by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And they've been bestowed upon us abundantly for no other reason than we are God's children. And as the Apostle Matthew tells us, God is a father, a good, good father who delights in giving his children good gifts. So how do we combat this tendency within us and how is it that we can embrace the fruit that is our God-given birthright? I think the Apostle Paul tells us how in Galatians 5.16 when he says, I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And then he goes on to talk about the fruit of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. The key to being fruity Christians is to walk by the Spirit. A former pastor of mine, Randy Pope, he, he taught a message on this once called Appropriating the Power of the Holy Spirit. And uh, he did it using a passage from Romans 6, and I put a link to it in the app. Um, but Uh, You can get there if you don't use the app. You can go to perimeter.org slash pope and just scroll down to the audio section and you can link to it there. But let me give you the gist of it in a nutshell. Um, it's, It's three words, know, consider, present. To walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, we must first know the gospel. We have to know what it says. We have to know what it means. And we need to visit it often. It needs to become very familiar to us. We need to know what we know. And then second, we need to consider it to be true. I don't mean we need to think about it more. I mean, we need to think about it and meditate on it so much that it becomes second nature to us, that we consider it to be true, that it becomes one of our core beliefs, that it becomes so much a part of us that it's our identity. We consider it to be true. And then finally, we need to engage our will. We need to present our members as instruments of righteousness. We have to actually take action, turning away from our sin and turning towards God. And church, I believe that if we make this a regular part of our rhythm, if we do this daily, if we make sure that we know the gospel, consider it to be true, and then present ourselves as instruments of righteousness, if that becomes our regular rhythm of life, we will experience the power of the Holy Spirit and all of the fruit that it produces in us. So let's look at one of the fruits that we so often associate with Christmas. The greatest gift is love. 
We see that in 1 Corinthians 13, 13, where Paul writes, So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. The spiritual fruit of love is the greatest of them all, and it really shouldn't come as a surprise to us because it's, it's the only thing that is given to us as a reason for why God chose to save us. If you look at Ephesians 2, verses 4 through 5, it says, God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, even when we were still his enemies, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. See, love is the major theme throughout all of the scriptures. When the Pharisees tried to make it all about the law, what did Jesus do? He turned it back to love. He said that the greatest commandments, they're all about love. The first four commandments are about loving God. The last six are about loving your neighbor as you love yourself. We're told to love ourselves. We're told to love others. We're commanded even to love our enemies. Being loving is how we best emulate God. In in 1 John 14, we're told, God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. Why is love considered one of the fruits of Advent? Well, the Advent is about the incarnation of, of, of Jesus Christ. God himself took on human flesh. Why? Because he wanted to be with us. His name meant God with us. But more than that, he came to save the world. We see in John 3.16, what does it say? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that Whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Did you know this this is why we give gifts at Christmas? Right? The, The whole point of giving gifts at Christmas is to remind ourselves that God gives us good gifts. And he sent Christ to us. And he did that because of his love for us. And ultimately Jesus came so he could die for us. John 15, 13, Jesus I think he was speaking about himself when he said, um, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. It's all about love. And as born-again Christians, we can expect this kind of love to be our spiritual birthright. And when we're told that we will be known as disciples by our love for one another, and when we're commanded to be loving to God and to others, This is not intended to create a burden upon us so that we can prove our love to God. God does not love us because we love him. It is the exact opposite. 1 John 4.19, we love because he first loved us. That's why we love. That's how we can love because he first loved us. And our obedient love is a response to God's love for us. So let me be perfectly plain. There is absolutely nothing that you can do to make God love you more. He already loves you with a perfect and infinite love. And likewise, there is absolutely nothing that you can do that would ever make God love you less. Romans 8 38 through 39, for I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. You cannot do it. You don't have that kind of power. You don't have that kind of influence. You cannot separate yourself from the love of Christ. That we are loved by God is absolutely certain. It is true even though we may feel unlovable. It is true even though 
it's true that we don't deserve to be loved. It's true even though we do things that are hateful and that betray his perfect love for us. We have to remember the words of Romans 5.8. God showed his love for us in that while we were still sinners, before we would ever have chosen God, Christ died for us. He knew what he was getting into. He chose to love us even when we were still his enemies, when we were hostile to him, when we were children of the father of lies. That's when he made an eternal commitment, right? A covenant promise that he would be our God, our spiritual father, and we would be his people, the children of God. See, God is steadfast and faithful. He never changes his mind about us. Even when we forget that we're adopted and we behave like children of his enemy, he doesn't forget about us. Remember where we started this message was in Psalm 51 with King David lamenting that he was born a wretched sinner. This was a psalm of repentance. It was written just after David had been caught and confronted by his most grievous moral failures, adultery and murder. And the very first line of this psalm, I think, tells us something. It says this, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. David had betrayed God in some of the worst ways that we could imagine, but he knew that God's love was not dependent on David's faithfulness. It was grounded on God's faithfulness, his steadfastness. And God tells us, tells us in 1 Samuel that he chose David because David was a man after God's own heart. Isn't that amazing? When we know that God loves us, when we know this, and we truly believe it, right, we're considering it to be true, then it naturally follows that we will be more loving towards God and others. We will present ourselves as instruments of righteousness. David was a flawed sinner just like you, just like me. But he was most known, perhaps, for his great love. You know, there, there's people who thought that uh, Jonathan should have been king. Jonathan was King Saul's son, and that's how it worked, right? Kings, kings became uh, old, and then they were replaced by their sons. Well, God had a different plan. He chose David. And what would ordinarily happen when there's like a change of dynasty, right, is that the incoming power, as they're seizing power, to make sure that there isn't civil war and strife that happens later, they would round up all of the relatives of the outgoing king and execute them. That was how kingdoms traditionally changed hands. But David would have none of that. And he waited until Saul and Jonathan had both died before he came to power. And then he did tell his people, I need you to find me the descendants of Jonathan. I need to know who they are. And it looks like there was maybe only one who was still alive. And they found him. His name was Mephibosheth. And they brought him to David. But he didn't execute him. You know what he did? He restored to him all of Saul's lands. I'm pretty sure Mephibosheth was in hiding when they found him, right? I'm pretty sure when they brought him to the king, he was thinking, oh, this is it. But instead, he had all of his lands and titles restored to him. He was given influence. David said, come and live in my palace, and I'll treat you as if you were one of my very own sons. And every day of his life, Mephibosheth spent at David's table. He was honored. And why? Because David loved Jonathan and he wanted to honor Jonathan's son because of his great love. That's how we remember David. And he was a man after God's own heart indeed. What would it look like for us to be people who are after God's own heart. 
Well, I can think of no better place to look than 1 Corinthians 13, what we would typically call the love passage of the Bible. You probably heard it the last time that you attended a Christian wedding. Believe it or not, this was not written by the Apostle Paul as advice for a happy marriage. It's actually an excellent attempt at defining what is meant when we say that God shows steadfast love. And when we abide in Christ, he abides in us. And if he is love, we should expect the fruit of his love to shine through us. So let's see what that might look like. Love is patient and kind. God is patient with us. Though we fail in the same ways over and over. Though we're slow to do the right thing. God does not belittle us or bully us, but he gently corrects us through his Holy Spirit and through, his other, through the other Christians he puts around us. When we're abiding in Christ, we find that we can be charitable and we can be patient with others. It says, love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. See, God does not hold grudges against us. God doesn't even lord it over us how perfectly holy he is. He doesn't get annoyed when we're doing things that he doesn't like. See, God does not regret creating you. He does not regret entering into a covenant relationship with you. And when we're abiding in him, we find that we don't need to be right in order to be in relationship with other people. We find that we don't always have to have things done our own way. And we find that we don't keep records of wrongs that are committed against us. Love does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Maybe it goes without saying, but God doesn't rejoice at wrongdoing. He's never hoping that harm is going to come to us. He's not happy when we get what's coming to us because of our bad choices. When the sin of one wrongdoer harms another, God's not cheering that on. He's always happy when a sinner repents and embraces the gospel. And when we abide in him, we're able to desire for our own enemies to find the truth and come to repentance. We're able to rejoice when God even blesses those that we find it very difficult to love. Love bears all things. It believes all things. It hopes all things. It endures all things. All things is a long list. God doesn't get tired of all the nonsense that we get up to. He's not at his wit's end with us. God has infinite wits. He's not running out of patience because he's God. He's not even surprised. We're not wearing him out. We're not wearing him down. He knew what he was getting into when he chose us. When we're abiding, we find that we can trust God with the realities surrounding those that it's difficult for us to love. And we find that we don't have to give up on people. Finally, I just want to point out that with Christ, all things are possible. If you're like me, you're hearing this description of love, and maybe it's making you a bit nervous because you're thinking, man, there are definitely some people that I don't love, that I find it very difficult to love. When when you think about not giving up on someone, it might make you feel anxious or nervous or maybe afraid. When you think about Jesus' great command that he gives us in John 15, 12, right? Where Jesus said, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. And if you're like me, the first thing that pops in your head is you're like, that's easy for you to say, Jesus. Sometimes being loving just seems impossible, right? Well, I've got a couple of final thoughts on that. First, I I don't want anyone here to think that what I'm saying, don't don't walk out of here thinking that, that, Pastor Brandon told me that love endures all things and therefore I just have to put up with all the abuse. 
Sometimes the way we don't give up on people is by imposing healthy boundaries with them. Likewise, sometimes we can love someone best from a distance. And we don't have to enable their codependent and destructive behaviors. That's not love. If you're in an impossible situation like this, please seek godly counsel from someone who can help you apply the truth of Scripture in the midst of it. Second, regardless of what kind of situations you find in, you should be aware that impossible situations, that's just one of the side effects of living in the broken world that we live in. The reality is that we're loved by a God who routinely does the impossible. And we're told in the Gospels that what's impossible for man is possible with God. The Apostle Paul, he endured all kinds of impossible situations And yet he wrote about his ability to be content when he had much and his ability to be content when he had little. And then this is what he wrote in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. That word strengthens, that's in the present tense and it's an active word. What he's saying is, I can do all things because Jesus is actively strengthening me right now. That church is why we need to be abiding in him. He's the source of our power. His spirit within us is what is producing the fruit of Advent. To love one another as he has loved us is just not something that we're able to do on our own. We can't do it. But because of his love for us and because he has adopted us as his own, it's our spiritual birthright. And we can do it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us with perfect love. Thank you that you have patience with us, that you don't give up on us, that you endure who we are, though we don't deserve your love. We have it and we have it abundantly. Help us to believe that, Lord. Help us to embrace the truth of your gospel. Help us to see ourselves as you see us. As perfectly lovable, as valued children in your family. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, Pastor Ryan here. We're so glad that you've tuned in with us and watched one of our online sermons. Our vision as a church is to live as the family of God together, proclaiming and demonstrating the gospel of grace to one another in our city. If you don't have a church home or you're looking for a church, we'd invite you to attend one of our in-person worship gatherings so you can experience all that God has for us as a community of believers on mission.